Schmidt, and I am the archivist here at the Wade Center. It is our great pleasure to welcome Professor Jonathan R. Aller and his wife, Debbie, who's sitting over here to the Wade Center. Professor Aller is a Chancellor's Professor of English, the Director of the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies, and Senior Textual Editor of the Institute for American Thought at Indiana University's School of Liberal Arts. He first met Ray Bradbury in the late 1980s, eventually developing a working relationship that lasted until Mr. Bradbury's death in 2012. Most recently, Professor Aller authored Becoming Ray Bradbury, which was published in 2011, and Ray Bradbury Unbound, published in 2014. And I believe there is a third volume planned, yep, so to complete the set. And they're both biographical studies of Bradbury's early and middle career, so the third volume will be the late career. He also edits the collected stories of Ray Bradbury, which is a multi-volume series that covers the original versions of Bradbury's earliest tales. In 2013, he prefaced and prepared a new historical section for Simon & Schuster's 60th anniversary edition of Fahrenheit 451. Three of Professor Eller's books on Bradbury have been Locus Award finalists for Best Nonfiction Title in the Science Fiction and Fantasy field. His talk tonight is titled That High Truth, Lewis, Williams, Chesterton, and Bradbury. And we'll look at Bradbury's interest in those three Wade authors, as well as his own engagement in the art of mythopoeia. I just want to mention we'd appreciate if you silence your cell phones so that we can not have any distractions during the talk tonight. And we are recording this so you can see it on the Wade Center's YouTube channel after the event and share it with other people, hopefully, as well. So let's welcome Professor Elder tonight. Wade Center, where you preserve the work of seven fantastic authors of the 20th century, authors who on some level all had an impact on Ray Bradbury, that boy who grew up reading in libraries, going to movies, not really being a good learner in school, did not do well in lecture class environments. Um, was a gifted creative writer in high school for two years, but had to remediate the basic English language English courses uh, before he could graduate in 1938 from Los Angeles High School. But that man, Ray Bradbury, was influenced by at least three of the authors uh, whose legacy is preserved here. Uh, you see here uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, Charles Williams, and G.K. Chesterton. And in the years that uh, we would uh, be together working, studying, writing, preparing editions, and just plain having fun. We would, from time to time, touch on these writers and how they touched his life. What do we do at the Ray Bradbury Center? It's the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies, and uh, we have been in existence for, well, 11 years now. In 2007, we set up shop. Uh, and one of our publishing responsibilities is to produce the collected stories of Ray Bradbury, as Laura mentioned, and also to publish the new Ray Bradbury Review. We're up to issue six now with that periodical. And then uh, various biographical and critical works, as you see here. We also, since 2013, have had the great good fortune to conserve at the center basically Ray Bradbury's physical artifacts, his office, which we've recreated, his office of 50 years uh, in his Los Angeles home, we've recreated here with most of the original materials, his books, his, his working library, um, the uh, tables and desks, the little wooden desk he probably uh, typed, we're pretty sure, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, the stories that evolved into the Martian Chronicles, the Illustrated Man, and some of the other story collections. We have two of the portable typewriters from earlier years, but we have uh, under the glass on the desk that he had from the 1960s on, we have his last typewriter, one of his last two uh, Selectric Wheelwriter typewriters. Uh, the other one is in Waukegan, Illinois, in the public library with our good friends uh, from Waukegan, some of whom are here tonight, and uh, others who have uh, the responsibility of curating the family library and other artifacts like the typewriter. Uh, you'll see artifacts here, including the Nautilus submarine in the far corner, given to him by the Disney Imagineers. He worked for uh, the Disney uh, uh, folks for 40 years. Uh, he knew Walt Disney before Disney's death in 1966. 
Uh, you see a Mars globe given to him by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for all the work he did to help to foresee and dream about our future journeys to the planet Mars. Uh, there are many artifacts in this room uh, and uh, we have the responsibility of curating them. We also have an archival area uh, in another uh, section of the center where we have our reference library in the genres that he was best known for early in his career. Uh, supernatural fiction, which was what he hit his stride in first, eventually science fiction, detective fiction as well, and fantasy, of course, which overarched his entire career. We have the filing cabinets from his home, from his weekend home in Palm Springs, and many artifacts, uh, mementos from the space program, from the movies that were produced from his work. That's our responsibility at the Bradbury Center. Let's set the stage of Ray Bradbury, just give you a sense of who he is and how he will fit in with these far more well-read writers, these uh, more formally educated writers of the past who were important in his life closer to our present. We have the little boy known as Shorty sometimes there on the left in front of his Waukegan home uh, in around 1925. That house still stands minus the dormer, minus the wraparound porch and a few other uh, changes have been made to it, but um, uh, that's where he starts out in Waukegan. It was not an easy life. He's born there in 1920. His father was a lineman for the power company. Um, it was hard to keep a job when the Depression hit in 1929. By that time, two of the four children had already uh, died, victims of influenza in earlier years. Uh, his father lost his job as a lineman twice. They made two trips west in 1932 and again in 1934. Here they are in 34, just before his 14th birthday. His one surviving sibling, uh, Skip, is taking this photograph of them in their 1926 Buick hitting west al along the dirt roads and, and parts of pa partially paved Route 66 that took them eventually to Los Angeles. After a lot of looking, his father finally got a job with a wire cable company. And they lived then, really, Ray Bradbury lived there for the rest of his life. Uh, until 2012, and his seven-decade writing career began there after he graduated from Los Angeles High School in 1938. What did that young man do after his graduation from high school in 1938? He sold newspapers. He sold copies of the Herald Examiner, the afternoon edition, from 1938 into 1942, making one penny off of every three-cent newspaper he sold. Other classmates, of course, had gone into military service or into the job force or to college or to trade schools. But this is where he made the money that he lived on, still boarding with his parents, but it gave him the time to write. And he learned in these amateur years, finally, what he was good at writing. And what he was good at writing was stories that told emotional truths the hopes and fears, the aspirations and terrors, the dreams and the nightmares of children as they then grow on into adulthood. He could do these things truthfully because he had himself a vivid imagination and he experienced many of these things himself. And he always said that if you can tell the truth in a story of high emotional impact, then you have a style. And that was really the core of his style which evolved into being one of the great metaphor-rich writers of our time, a poetic writer who could write prose poetry. Aldous Huxley told him, you know what you are, you are a prose poet. And indeed, that's what this young man was who never was able to go to college a day in his life. Um, he published in all the genres of the pulp magazines, and by the end of World War II, was publishing in the mainstream magazines. Uh, eventually Collier's, uh, Esquire, the Saturday Evening Post, Mademoiselle, a wide range of the major market magazines becoming one of the most name recognized writers of our time. He uh, was placed in O. Henry Award volumes. He won four Best American Short Stories annual uh, volume placements as well. And then the book titles, the books that have never been out of print, The Martian Chronicles, The Illustrated Man, The Golden Apples of the Sun, Fahrenheit 451. The October Country, where he collected his supernatural stories. Dandelion Wine, about growing up here just one county away in the Midwest in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes, and I Sing the Body Electric, 
all of those and really most of his lifetime output are still in print today. It's a remarkable record. In Hollywood, doors open for him there. He had Academy Award nomination, two Emmys, a Grammy for recording, um, and um, he eventually, through books like Fahrenheit 451, written at the height of the climate of fear in the United States in the McCarthy era, an anti-authoritarian book. Imagine that, an inversion of the real world where firemen set fires, they don't put them out. And these have impact. And some of the great influences of the 20th century, like Lord Bertrand Russell here, uh, not at all like the authors of the Wade Center in many ways, but still one of the great influences of the 20th century would say the sort of future society that he portrays is only too possible. And if you notice on his armchair, he has the English edition of Fahrenheit 451, about the early 1954 when Ray Bradbury was invited to visit him at his home. Dreams of Space is another Ray Bradbury Hallmark, beginning in the 1950s, telling stories about what it's like to dream about going to space. He was not numerate. He was literate, self-taught literate, but he was not numerate. He um, inspired astronauts, astrophysicists, planetary scientists, astronomers. They all knew his work at one phase of their lives or another. And our dream of going to space begins with his dreams of going to space. We see the epitome of that in 1971 when he's invited to witness the insertion into Martian orbit of Mariner 9, our first chance to actually orbit and photographically assay the planet Mars. He meets Werner von Braun for the first time that night, and von Braun writes on one of Ray Bradbury's envelopes to Ray Bradbury, who had it all figured out long ago with admiration, Werner von Braun, amazing. That says it all, we could have gone through a litany of awards and lists and things, but to show you the breadth of this young writer's influence, writing instinctively, writing without formal training, writing from reading he did often at public libraries and university libraries where you could read for free, something that he wanted to protect for his whole career, that's where he starts out. That sets the stage, and you can see culminates in, again, not too many folks without a college education are going to hold the National Book Award or a Lifetime Pulitzer Prize citation or the National Medal of Arts from the President of the United States or the other awards that I mentioned earlier as well. That's Ray Bradbury, who among his loves included three writers who are preserved here at the Wade Center. Well, selective influences. You have, uh, let's just throw some of Lewis's up there uh, as sort of a refresher. You have George MacDonald, of course, um, G.K. Chesterton. Uh, I know that it, one of the favorites was The Everlasting Man. Uh, Charles Williams, of course, is an influence on Lewis uh, uh, during the years that, that Williams, especially the years that he was uh, living uh, in Oxford when the press work was moved out from wartime London. And of course, his good friend J.R.R. Tolkien. For Bradbury, now there are many American influences on Bradbury, Hawthorne, Poe, you name them. But for the, uh, uh, on the British side, George MacDonald. Uh, whereas we know Lewis loved uh, MacDonald's uh, unspoken sermons. I think if you look in, in Lewis's anthology collection of, of, of uh, lines, uh, from rememberable lines from MacDonald. It's largely, a lot of them are from the un unspoken sermons. For Bradbury, it's the gold key. It's the gold key, which coincidentally was also uh, Lewis's favorite fairy tale, acknowledged favorite fairy tale. Bradbury loved Garrett Manley Hopkins, uh, the uh, British 19th century uh, short-lived British poet. Um, he loved the unsprung meters. He loved the metaphors of Hopkins. He loved the strings of adjective. You see that kind of thing in Bradbury's work. And I believe the first edition of Hopkins' poems was edited by Charles Williams, and I wouldn't be surprised if Bradbury came to, uh, uh, to Hopkins through that uh, mediated edition uh, by Williams. H.G. Uh, Wells, of course, for Bradbury was important. Gerald Hurd, uh, John Collier, another mythopoeic writer, according to some. Uh, Bernard Shaw and G.K. Chesterton, also the everlasting man. Uh, Charles Williams, Descend into Hell, which we'll talk about shortly. Henri Bergson and Nikos Kazantzakis, which uh, lead to uh, Bradbury's settled 
views on faith, which we're going to cover first uh, here in the sequence tonight. Lewis and Bradbury, faith and morality. These are important issues, as important or more important today perhaps than ever before. And just to set the stage, here's the modernist view by Joseph Wood Crooch, who, who um, Bradbury read. As you can see, this is a quote from page 249 of Ray Bradbury's first edition copy, which Bradbury purchased in 1947. But the, the, the first part of this quotation, of course, is part of the modernism that I think that both Lewis and, and Bradbury would reject, would want to walk away from. Uh, Crouch says, if we no longer believe in either our infinite capacities or our importance to the universe, we know at least that we have discovered the trick which has been played upon us. That's in some ways a brave statement uh, on uh, a statement that many people would say reflects reality. Bradbury would deny it. He would say, I don't need tragedies and revelations that teach me how to die. I need tragedies that teach me how to live, how to live. And I think that this is something, again, that shows the sensibilities between Bradbury and Lewis. Now, Bradbury, and I think, and Lewis would both agree that nature issuing her last warning may bid us embrace some new illusion before it is too late, but we prefer rather to fail in our own way than to succeed in hers. I would say that Lewis and Bradbury would say that is not an illusion, however. Now, let's start with Lewis, Faith Restored, okay? And this is, of course, from Surprised by Joy, that great statement of after rationally and emotionally and at great length wrestling with these issues in the late 1920s, Lewis comes to this point. I was allowed to play at philosophy no longer. I had always wanted, above all things, not to be interfered with. I had wanted, mad wish, to call my soul my own. Not the slightest assurance on that score was offered me. Total surrender, the absolute leap in the dark, were demanded. The reality with which no treaty can be made was upon me. The demand was not even all or nothing. Now the demand was simply all. And this leads inevitably to, I think, one of the, the statements by Lewis that I find very inspirational. It's simple, it's straightforward. The story of Christ is simply a true myth a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with this tremendous difference that it really happened. This from a letter to Arthur Greaves in October of 1931. Now, we'll see a lot of the same sensibilities and emotional sincerity at play in Ray Bradbury as he goes through from being a teenager who had decided to step away from his Baptist Midwest background and uh, become a non-believer, eventually then to re-embrace uh, God the Creator, and to have great respect for religious traditions. But in Bradbury's case, the distinction is that he will privilege a faith in mankind equal to and in some ways transcendent of faith in God. So that would be one way to see a distinction there. And let's take a look at how that emerges. Bradbury's alternative to modernism. Now, uh, he often spoke at Caltech. They, they really enjoyed having him there because generations of aerospace scientists would, would emerge from Caltech inspired by him. And in 1971, he said, I was worried about going out of existence completely once we hit Mars. In other words, once we get to Mars. But then I realized that what I was doing was writing fairy stories, writing a mythology, doing a Bible, really, the Martian Chronicles is very much akin to the childhood influences on me of the Old and New Testament. He would go on to say to Russell Kirk, and this is quoted in Russell Kirk's Enemies of the Permanent Things, published in 1969, but earlier in the 1960s he wrote to Kirk and said on this point, I speak of no paranoic illusion of mythology which would supremacize man to the detriment of the supreme being. This is in the space age, in the advances of the space age he's talking. I seek only to weld the two. If man flings himself from Earth to other planets, it will be the act of God who does not intend to risk his sentience, Bradbury says, his awareness, his chance for eternity, 
by allowing himself to remain upon one lonely planet Earth. Um, it's kind of hard to unpack unless you look back and pick up on what he was reading through the 50s into the 1960s. And this is where he gets his settled views on faith. Henri Bergson, he had this guy had read other writers to work his way to Bergson. He gets to Bergson through Bertrand Russell. Uh, in Bergson, he begins to apprehend ways of, of looking at what the nature of time is. But it's really directly through Nikos Kazantzakis, the writer who almost wins the Nobel Prize in, I believe it was 1956 or 57, losing out by, I think they always said, a matter of one vote uh, in the uh, Nobel Prize to Albert Camus. But Kazantzakis, in The Saviors of God, maintains that we can restore the God buried in our matter and in our souls. It's Kazantzakis who refers to Bergson and Bergson's principle of the élan vital, the life force, that all protoplasmic life from the beginning has had that vitality, that urge to live. And Bergson would say that man is simply the latest manifestation of élan vital. And Nikos Kazantzakis would say, let's celebrate that, let's restore the God within us. And Bradbury, who was really looking for a way to reconcile the space age with the traditions of faith, and was having trouble, quite frankly, with the idea of beginnings and endings, okay? Ray Bradbury was always uneasy with Big Bang. He was more of a steady state universe kind of guy, especially in the middle years of his career. But what Kazantzakis is offering is a continuum. And Bradbury would settle on believing that we must take the best aspects of mankind to the stars. His aspirational form of science fiction aims to evangelize a cosmic purpose for the human race. If we go out to the stars, we rejuvenate God's majesty in the universe. Very unorthodox, it's not Christian but it's his way of witnessing and celebrating the space age. A distinction between our authors here and Ray Bradbury, but with the same kind of emotional force and sincerity uh, that we see in these authors, and we can understand why I think Bradbury enjoyed reading many of them. Now, knowing that, this makes sense. When he writes the award-winning articles he would write for Life Magazine in the 60s that helps America embrace the Apollo program, the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. He writes, we fear we may suicide ourselves away with hydrogen bombs before the savior rockets pluck us by our bootstraps and walk us on fire paths of escape. The metaphor man, right? Uh, he always saw the rocket as two things, either sealing our doom with destruction or taking us to the planets on our way to the stars. He says, once man is continuous, once the treadle of fire weaves him infinite and immortal from Mars to Pluto to the Colsac Nebula and the threat of racial death banished, the questions about annihilation will be meaningless. So there's our distinction between two authors that actually read each other's work, Lewis and Bradbury. Now the modern tradition of moral fantasy, as encapsulated by Russell Kirk, again, in his important 60s uh, volume, Enemies of the Permanent Things, cites George MacDonald, William Morris, Gerald Hurd, John Collier, Charles Williams, C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, Jaquetta Hawks, and Ray Bradbury as being the writers who are going to restore the values through their moral fantasy. And Kirk says specific about Bradbury, but it applies to all of these writers. The trappings of science fiction may have attracted young people to Bradbury, but he has led them on to something much older and better. Mythopoeic literature, normative truth acquired through wonder. Bradbury's stories are not an escape from reality. They are windows looking upon enduring reality. Now Gilbert Hyatt, a great literary critic, an American by way of Scotland, writes in 1965 that Ray is a neoclassical fabulist. Bradbury's stories are not realistic, but they are human. His stories take place in the world of the spirit. He would have written stories equally disconcerting and equally distinguished if he had been born not in 1920, but in 1820, or 1520, or 20 AD. It's the spirit and passion here, really fundamentally, that he shares 
with the writers we're discussing tonight. I'd like to move on to Bradbury and Lewis. As Lewis might say, there's a devil in this mess, and uh, that is materialism and modernity. Um, Ray Bradbury, like Aldous Huxley, and I would say that we can group Lewis in this, uh, reflect the old juvenilian question from the first century AD. Uh, who watches the watchers? Okay, quis custodiet ipsos custodes? Who watches the watchers? This is our concern, not so much with the technology, but what we do with it. I think this is another key nexus with, certainly with Lewis and Bradbury. So, the substitution of science and technology for God deeply destroyed Lewis as it emerged in science fiction. Lewis says in a, water, uh, I'm sorry, in a letter to Roger Lancelin Green in 1938, I like the whole interplanetary idea as mythology and simply wish to conquer for my own Christian point of view what has always hitherto been used by the opposite side. And of course, whereas Lewis at this point, he's writing and publishing Out of the Silent Planet, the first of the trilogy. He goes on to say in uh, his essay on science fiction, he says, more specifically, the science fiction of engineers is written by people who are primarily interested in space travel or in other undiscovered techniques as real possibilities in the actual universe. I am too uneducated scientifically to criticize such stories on the mechanical side. And I am so completely out of sympathy with the projects they anticipate that I am incapable of criticizing them as stories. Uh, Bradbury will try and give man an inspiration to do good in the universe. Lewis feels that we will go out there and it will be just too tempting to be bad. In Out of the Silent Planet, of course, Mars is a prelapsian world, sort of like uh, Perilandra, Venus will be, where the people still walked with God. And for Lewis, it's important, isn't it, that um, you, are, you need to be capable of feeling awe when you see the awesome and feeling horror when you see the horrible. And of course, the characters in the trilogy, other than Ransom, opposed to Ransom, you have Weston and Divine, and uh, these are people who get it all wrong. Lewis says about them going to Mars to take them over. The generalization that Lewis makes is there would have been no redemption in such a perfect world because it would not have needed redeeming. We should have much to learn from such people and nothing to teach them. We'd find some reason for exterminating them. Okay, and Ransom, who's thrown into this, who is innately a man of God, discovers that the three races on Mars are really God's creatures. Weston just wants to use them and destroy them. Fortunately, that does not happen. Now, in Paralandra, we get a little deeper into this. Lewis's narration says, Weston was a man obsessed with the idea, which is at the moment circulating all over our planet in obscure works of scientification, one of the, the evolutionary terms toward the term science fiction, uh, works of scientification in little interplanetary societies and rocketry clubs and between the covers of monstrous magazines, ignored or mocked by the intellectual, but ready if ever the power is put into its hands to open a new chapter of misery for the universe. The destruction or enslavement of other species in the universe, if such there are, is to these minds a welcome corollary. Um, uh, people who would engage in debate with him, like the young uh, Arthur C. Clarke and others, who would meet him and debate with him in correspondence, just didn't get it. I mean, didn't figure out that, that, uh, that we couldn't find achievement and reward in going to space. Uh, Lewis takes the opposite view. They met, I think, at one of the, uh, one of the public houses in Oxford for a, for a few drinks and agreed to, to, uh, to depart disagreeing but not, uh, not as enemies. Although Lewis muttered that, I'm sure that most of your colleagues are most horrible people, or words to that effect. I think, <laughs> I think it's how it goes. So in that hideous strength, which is the culmination of the trilogy, right, you have 
uh, just to refresh everybody's minds, Lewis sets this final novel in mid-20th century England, right at the end of World War II, when the emerging world is becoming apparent to a lot of people. Bradbury's writing in his papers about what's coming next, what kind of a, a post-colonial maybe, we don't know yet, a, a bipolar maybe, we don't know yet, world is going to emerge. Uh, Lewis sets the, the novel then in England at, at that time, where a modern Tower of Babel is emerging, a totalitarian state hidden within a huge technological research complex. Lewis makes much use of the Christian elements in the Arthurian legend, pointing up the threat that unrestrained materialism poses to religious and moral values. Unrestrained materialism, it's, it's a fantastic novel with an eye popper of an ending. And this is, of course, very close to Bradbury's take. Uh, by this time, now, by the early 50s, Bradbury has published the Martian Chronicles, collecting the stories into a half-cousin to a novel, as his editor would call it, uh, in, in 1950. Then uh, The Illustrated Man in 1951, and The Golden Apples of the Sun stories in 1953, just before he publishes Fahrenheit 451. So from this vantage point, Bradbury would say, the, some of the stories about Mars in the Martian Chronicles are really about conspicuous consumption and really about materialism. And he says what prompted him was seeing various issues of Vogue magazine and Harper's Bazaar where the models behaved outrageously in far places in outre climates. Uh, seeing a Coca-Cola stand near the Egyptian Sphinx and pyramids further irritated me. These were the grains of sand which popped into my oyster mouth caused me to grow a pearl, or if not a pearl, at least a somewhat amusing tale about the first man to build a hot dog stand on Mars. <laughs> and one of those stories is in the Martian Chronicles. Uh, Bradbury would say in an unpublished uh, little essay, it was really a speech he would give occasionally around that time, how I wrote my book, The Martian Chronicles, he said, in my home in Illinois there was a man who prowled the streets in the year 1928 who was known as the Lonely One. Our Waukegan contingent tonight knows about the Lonely One. Someday his sons, or the sons of his sons, will go to Mars, thinking they will find a planet like a seer's crystal in which to read a magnificent future. What they'll find instead is the somewhat shopworn image of themselves. Mars is a mirror, not a crystal. And Sir Fred Hoyle, great astronomer and a fair science fiction writer himself, writes in the introduction to the Time, uh, uh, time Life reprint of the Martian Chronicles. The author has used Mars in place of Earth. Ray Bradbury encloses us in a hall of mirrors that mercilessly reflects our way of life, distorting to emphasize more urgently faults in ourselves and in our civilization. With stealthy strokes, he lulls us into smug self-satisfaction and then ruthlessly thrusts our faces against the whole crooked, grinding, greedy setup on Earth. Mars is a mirror, not a crystal. Can we go there and not destroy yet another planet? And if we start to, can we then perhaps have a second chance? Ken Crossan, one of Ray Bradbury's fellow writers of the day, writes this interesting bottom line to the whole idea of Ray and materialism. Bradbury represents the voice of the poet raised against the mechanization of mankind. To him there has been only a difference of degree between the atom bomb and man tossing beer cans into Martian canals. One destroys the whole man, the other indicates the inner man is already destroyed. So these are kindred spirits, Lewis and Bradbury, when it comes to materialism. And Bradbury, in, in the, I would recommend to you the, the core story in uh, the Martian Chronicles is called And the Moon Be Still is Bright. Here it is in its pulp magazine form before the Martian Chronicles ever came together as a book. Here you have the archaeologist of the fourth expedition basically sets out to kill the rest of the members of the crew when he realizes that the crew and the crews that will follow are set up to destroy the ruins of the recently deceased Martian culture and all that they stood for. And why are they dead? Because they all caught the chicken pox from the first three expeditions. Not smallpox, chicken pox. Bradbury makes it as, as, as pathetic as he can in that sense. Now, the archaeologist confronting the captain who 
really sympathizes with the archaeologist in, in many ways, says, the archaeologist says, the Martians knew how to live with nature and get along with nature. They didn't try too hard to be all men and no animal. That's the mistake we made when Darwin showed up. We embraced him and Huxley and Freud, all smiles. And then we discovered that Darwin and our religions didn't mix. Or at least we didn't think they did. We were fools. We tried to budge Darwin and Huxley and Freud. They wouldn't move very well. So like idiots, we tried knocking down religion. The men of Mars realized that in order to survive, they would have to forego asking that one question any longer. Why live? Life was its own answer. Life was the propagation of more life and the living of as good a life as possible. They knew that science is no more than an investigation of a miracle we can never explain, and art is an interpretation of that miracle. Don't show me tragedies that teach me how to die. Don't ask why live. Show me how to live. Learn it from nature. Now, this is a letter that uh, Laura and I uh, have talked over a few times. And, and uh, Keith Call, if you're here tonight, I don't know if you are. Uh, Keith Call, who is uh, one of the uh, special collections librarians here on campus, actually showed me this letter, which is a letter um, uh, that's up and down in the internet from time to time. And it speaks volumes to what we're talking about here. Bradbury is a writer of great distinction, Lewis says, to a third party. Is his style almost too delicate, too elusive, too nuancé for SF matter? In that respect, I take him and me to be at opposite poles. He is a humble disciple of Corot and Debussy, I an even humbler disciple of Titian and Beethoven. Unpack that. It's very rewarding. You know, do the homework on this, and you'll find that the Bradbury, he's got Bradbury spot on in those two words. Corot, the great early romantic French painter who then steps away and promotes and celebrates those who come after. This is Ray Bradbury, the witness and celebration of the space age. And Debussy, of course, Ray Bradbury, the dreamer, his dreams of the universe, his dreams of small town life become our dreams. Perfect match. Uh, Lewis, disciple of Titian and Beethoven, unpack that any way you wish, especially those of you who are, are probably better Lewis uh, readers than I am. Uh, Titian, of course, the great Venetian master, the giant masterpieces and canvases, studies in dark and light contrast. That's Lewis, concerned with the darkness and the lightness, and by the grace of God, helping the lightness to prevail, right? And Beethoven, dun, 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 dun. There's nothing holding back in C.S. Lewis, is there, when he debates. That's just some basic unpacking. Do your own. It's a remarkable piece of correspondence. Um, and the content is, uh, is very illuminating, I think. Lewis felt most at ease with science fiction where the marvelous is in the grain of the whole work. And he talks about that kind of science fiction, which he could really tolerate. Um, if good novels are comments on life, good stories of this sort, which are very much rarer, are actual additions to life. They give, like certain rare dreams, sensations we never had before and enlarge our conception of the range of possible experience. Science fiction that really draws on the fantasy of the human heart and human spirit and the human mind. And he gives you a catalog of these works. Uh, the Odyssey, The Fairy Queen, Beckford's Vatek, McDonald's Fantaste, and Lilith, The Golden Key. Uh, Edison's Worm Ouroboros, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, also Mervyn Peake's Titus Crone. Finally, some of Ray Bradbury's stories perhaps make the grade. <laughs> Ray's copy of this volume uh, of, of, uh, uh, in which uh, science fiction is published uh, later on in Ray's library has a paper clip on that page and a little red arrow that points to where it says that. I think he was greatly gratified and humbled to see that to see him thrown in like that. Bradbury's working library volumes include the screw tape letters, uh, and it's dated uh, in his signature to 1948. He loved the screw tape letters. He liked point counterpoint. He loved debate. He loved uh, dialectic, okay? Uh, the Great Divorce. I think, I would say that if we had to guess when Bradbury comes into contact with uh, George MacDonald, it may be through uh, um, uh, The Great Divorce. 
because his interlocutor, right, uh, in the last <laughs> section of that novel is George MacDonald. And this may be where Ray is led to him. And his copy of The Great Divorce, he purchases in January 1954 when he's in England and Ireland. Uh, at this point, he's uh, still in Ireland uh, uh, scripting Moby Dick for John Huston, which would be one of Bradbury's great breaks into Hollywood. Um, an experiment in criticism uh, is important because this is beginning of reader response career, uh, uh, theory in some ways, right? The reader's view is important, perhaps more important than that of the isolated um, uh, ivy-covered tower intellectual view of the work of literature. And that would resonate with Bradbury. He cares about what people think when they read literature. What do they love in the literature? Do they love the same things he loves? And I think that that would be why an experiment in criticism would have resonated with Bradbury. Uh, you see other volumes here, The Abolition of Man, okay? Uh, for instance, the, uh, um, you know, the idea that there are just some universal values that rise above any artificial values created by any society. Bradbury would have resonated with that because he was an anti-authoritarian kind of writer. He was neither far left nor far right. He was an individualist who infuriated uh, dictatorships of the far left and the far right. And uh, I, I think, again, a kindred spirit with Lewis. So we see uh, the volumes that he had. And finally, in the 1990s, he finally got a copy of Out of the Silent Planet. I never could discover that he read that, but he was aware of it. He was aware of Narnia, but he loved the screw tape letters. Absolutely loved them. Bradbury and Lewis, Pulp Fictions. This is just a quick few slides to say that sooner or later, the publishing world is going to get a hold of you. So Bradbury, because of his pulp background, uh, as late as 1953, Time Magazine would still say, a first-class writer of spook stuff who also happens to have more than a twitch of the poet in him, a poet of the pulps. And yet that poet of the pulps was Dylan Thomas's favorite fantasy writer. Huh? And this is an author, a poet, who dies in 1953 or 54, 53, I think. Um, Lewis is pulled into the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, which is a higher quality sort of successor. It comes out in the pulp age, but survives as a digest magazine, really right down to the present day. And uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the editors in chief, uh, Tony Boucher, Anthony Boucher, uh, persuades Lewis to put some of his stories, which are largely satirical send-ups, two of them into the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And I would suspect that either through uh, Joy Davidman, uh, who had, I, I, again, uh, we know that in Lewis's library books or her library books, I believe we have a couple of early volumes of Bradbury, but certainly through Tony Brout Boucher even earlier may be how uh, Lewis came to be reading Bradbury. And Lewis indeed publishes The Shoddy Lands about uh, what happens if you can fall into another person's mind or alter another person's reality. Bradbury was also writing stories like that. Ministering Angels, the, the, the satire of uh, the scientists at the time were saying we would have to send uh, um, everything to Mars to take care of the crews, including women, to ease their tensions and to provide pleasure for them scientific article that really raised a lot of hackles at the time in the 1950s and prompted Lewis to write Ministering Angels, where he says, okay, let's send people to Mars and see how that works out, uh, because it's obviously not, um, uh, uh, not a good idea to do this kind of thing. And Bradbury, though, spins it a different way. What if along with the pioneer men going to Mars, there are pioneer women who are not, women who are not being sent to Mars to be subservient or slaves to the men, which is what the scientific article had suggested, but going instead to make their fortunes, to find maybe their husbands. And you see the line here, strange, strange, to marry on another world. Well, sooner or later, they're going to even get Lewis. Avon Books publishes Paralandra with that cover paperback in the 1950s, and also uh, publishes that hideous strength under the title The Tortured Planet with the uh, editorial teaser, science fiction masterpiece of a super race dedicated to evil. Okay. So uh, it happened to Bradbury. It happened to Lewis. <laughs> Something Wicked This Way comes. Bradbury and Charles Williams. This is interesting because um, 
there's not a clear-cut connection there. Uh, in the years that I would piece by piece inventory uh, Ray's library during trips out to California, um, I had a conversation with uh, Rob Robert Woods, uh, a scholar uh, from Faulkner University, who was uh, uh, doing a lot of research on Bradbury and Christian uh, elements in his writing. And he said, John, do you think that Ray ever read Descent into Hell by Charles Williams? And I said, well, I'm not sure. Let me, let me look at the inventory. And sure enough, there was a copy in the library, uh, Ray's, Ray's personal library. And Robert said, there, there's just an atmosphere in, of evil and evil power and evil illusion and evil control in Descent into Hell that's just almost magically parallel in Something Wicked This Way Comes. So I went and I asked Ray the next trip out. I said, do you remember reading Charles Williams' Descent into Hell? He said, yes, I remember. Did it have an impact on you? Oh, yes. And it was about the time that I was writing that novel. The vital importance of Lily Samily in Descent into Hell is not easy to discover on a first read or even a second read. But you see her as a, as a figure who can create temptation. First in Pauline's destiny. Pauline said, leaning over the gate, oh, I'm much better now. That's good, the other woman said, but take care of yourself. Think of yourself. Be careful of yourself. I could make you perfectly safe and perfectly happy at the same time. You really haven't any idea of how happy you could be, Lily Samley says to her. Pauline is conflicted because she's having an apparition from the past. One of her ancestors was burned at the stake for religious convictions, mm -hmm. and that person is looking for one of their descendants to help put them to rest. And Pauline doesn't understand what's happening, and she just wants to get away from it. And Lily Samily says, oh, put yourself in my hands. It will be OK. Pauline, I don't understand. The other went on, my dear, it's simple. If you'll come with me, I can fill you. Fill your body with any sense you choose. I can make you feel whatever you choose to be. I can give you certainty of joy for every moment of life. Secretly, secretly, no other soul. No other living soul. Now, Wentworth, the historian who also lives in the same English village, is ambitious. He wants to be the leading historian in his specialty, and he wants to marry a particular woman in the village, even though she has no interest in him. And Lily Samley can give her a dream avatar of the other woman. The other woman, Adela, and he's able to have fantasies where she seems to be manifest in his life, but she's not there and he slowly descends into hell. Pauline pulls back. Wentworth cannot. Since that first night when he encounters the ghost, the shade of Adela, she comes to him often. His life descends into oblivion. Now, what I find really just in the last year, reading Greville Lindup's wonderful Charles Williams III Inkling, which is partially researched on fellowship here, and I think uh, it's great credit uh, to both the Wade and to his scholarship that he was able to work here. And on page 277, I see the breakout. Beneath her suburban disguise, Lily Samily is the demon Lilith, mistress of Samael, a dark angel from Hebrew myth, sometimes identified with the angel of death. And that is perfectly the alignment with something wicked this way comes. And Mr. Dark, who runs the predatory carnival who comes to town, who mesmerizes the two young boys, Jim and Will, Jim Nightshade um, and Will Halloway. Mr. Dark explodes his laugh. He extends his hand, his shirt sleeve. He pulls it up. Bright purple, black green, lightning blue eels, worms and Latin scrolls slide to view on his wrist. Boy, Will cries, you must be the tattooed man. No, Jim studied the stranger, the illustrated man. There's a difference. Jim stared. The arm was like a cobra weaving, bobbing to strike. Jim stood like a runner who has come a long way, fever in his mouth, hands open to receive any gift. And right now it was a gift of pictures twitched in pantomime. As Mr. Dark made his illustrations jerk cold skinned over his warm pulsed wrist. And then he'll close up his sleeve again and entice Jim to come back later. 
and will show you the secrets that you want because you, young boy, want to be a man and share in those secrets. I can give that to you. He gets that power and that terror and that horror element, I think is inspired in Bradbury from reading Descent into Hell. No doubt about it. The nature of the carnival. Jim then asks Will's father, Mr. Halloway, is, is it death? Is the carnival death? Will's father says, the carnival, no, but I think it uses death as a threat. Death doesn't exist. It never did. It never will. But we've drawn so many pictures of it, so many years, trying to pin it down, comprehend it. We've got to thinking of it as an entity, strangely alive and greedy. All it is, however, is a stop watch, a loss, an end, a darkness, nothing. And the carnival wisely knows we're more afraid of nothing than we are of something. It's time to move to a lighter note, folks, <laughs> and to see Ray Bradbury and G.K. Chesterton. Bradbury's love of Chesterton results in him going out of his way to even find a memento of Chesterton. He bought, and, and, uh, and uh, we now have at the Bradbury Center, this nicely framed up um, uh, letter. It's a business letter from Chesterton, I believe, to a publisher uh, from, I believe, the 1920s. And then the picture of Chesterton tipped in as well into the frame. We know that Bradbury loved uh, G.K. Chesterton uh, first through The Everlasting Man, uh, where you see the incredible miracle of the human mind and the art it produces. Uh, you can approach matters of faith you can approach them rationally. You can approach them emotionally. But you, you have to give your whole mind to the idea of, of faith as, as a miracle, as man still within uh, the context of its faith still to be a creature that can be inspired and create. That was what Bradbury really enjoyed in The Everlasting Man. The Club of Queer Trades, delightful stories about a detective, very off-trail things. Ray Bradbury's detective stories were all off-trail. They weren't normal. They weren't worked out logically. They weren't uh, the typical kinds of things we would call a detective trail. The Man Who Was Thursday, which is basically an espionage story or a, a sort of Secret Service story, uh, novel uh, that is sort of perched on the threshold of a dream. And Bradbury was all about the dreams that emerge from our subconscious minds. And then the great debates between Shaw and Chesterton. The inevitability of the Shavian life force, says Bernard Shaw, versus God-given free will and creative powers. That, of course, is always going to resonate with Ray Bradbury. Again, many books in the library that uh, were Chesterton books. Uh, besides The Everlasting Man, these volumes, these volumes as well, uh, some of them purchased as early as the 1940s. And then finally, late in life, Bradbury publishes this poem in a special edition, The RB, GKC, and GBS Forever Orient Express. What if we could have a train? And climbing on board are the masters of ceremony, G.K. Chesterton, and George Bernard Shaw. And on the train will be all my favorite writers, will be Poe and Dickens, and um, uh, they will all have a great night together. And when I die, will this dream truly be entrained with Shaw and Chesterton and me? Oh, glorious Lord, please make it so, that down a long eternity will row and a tilted headlong, nattering the way, all mouth, no sleep, and endless be our day, the Chesterton night tour, the Shaw Express, a picnicking of brains in London dress, as one by one we cleave the railroad steam to circumnavigate my noon and midnight dreams. It goes on for about four pages. It's an homage to Chesterton. You gotta love a man who can write like this. Well, what is that high truth as we get ready to summarize tonight? As Russell Kirk observed, Ray Bradbury was a master at presenting that high truth which is best revealed by allegory and proliferating fancy. Unless humane literature is returned to its normative purpose, telling us what it is to be truly human, 
the degradation of the human condition may not be long delayed. Well, that kind of wake-up call we see in Ray Bradbury inspires first British intellectuals, and not just Lewis, but Christopher Isherwood and Aldous Huxley, who of course at that time are expatriates living in the States. And through them, the word gets back and Gerald Hurd becomes a fan. W.H. Auden becomes a fan of Ray Bradbury. Stephen Spender, Dylan Thomas, Graham Greene, all these writers. We know three Nobel laureates read Ray Bradbury. Um, John Steinbeck read Ray Bradbury's stories to his children. Okay. So Bradbury had this pull, this ability to get to that high truth in the tradition of Lewis and other writers. Bradbury would say in his introduction to his collection, Timeless Stories for Today and Tomorrow, an anthology of, of fiction stories, his favorites, in 1952, Bradbury would say in the introduction, I have nothing but my emotions to go on. I am compensated by allowing myself to believe that while the scientific man can tell you the exact size, location, pulse, musculature, and color of the heart, we emotionalists can find it and touch it quicker. Bradbury was an emotionalist. He loved the writers whose works came to life for him. He always wanted to be on the bookshelves with these other writers. He felt they were alive in their works, and he always wanted to do something to help them live forever as well. He would write stories about saving F. Scott Fitzgerald from his decline in Hollywood, saving um, Ernest Hemingway from slowly dying from all the injuries accumulated in his life uh, in Ketchum, Oregon. He wanted to save writers, and he would always want to paint a better picture of the writers he loved. One night, when I was visiting him 11 years ago in 2007, we were talking about uh, Lewis and Joy Davidman. And Ray turned to talking about the movie Shadowlands, which I think on many levels is a good film. There's excellent acting. Um, I believe Deborah Winger even came here to study uh, at one point. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderfully acted. But uh, the ending, Bradbury didn't care for. And frankly, he didn't care for one other thing about it. He wanted to see more of Lewis. He wanted to see more of Joy Davidman. And that night, he said to me, they didn't prove she was a writer. They didn't prove he was a philosopher and that he wrote screw tape letters. That would have helped the film, you see. And I've written an ending for that film. The ending, they had just sort of drifted off. But I wanted an ending where he's with the boy the mother has died, and they've got the big cabinet. What do they call that? The wardrobe, I said. Yes, the wardrobe. And I said to the boy in my script, go over to the wardrobe and look in. And he doesn't want to do it because there's nothing there. And C.S. Lewis says, go over to the wardrobe and look in. And he goes over, oh, <clears throat> opens the door. And there's a fantasy land inside, painted there. C.S. Lewis has painted it. And the boy falls more completely in love with his new father. And that's the ending of the film. I never gave it to them. It was too late, of course. Ray Bradbury loved the writers who gave him treasures for the heart. And I certainly received a treasure that night when Ray Bradbury told me his final feelings for C.S. Lewis and his world. Thank you. John, that was uh, really cool to see all those different threads being pulled together. And I have not known that aspect of Ray Bradbury before tonight, so that's really neat. Um, if you do need to head out, you're welcome to do so, but we do have some time for some questions and answers. So I'm going to walk the microphone around for anybody who'd like to ask a question. It's better if you speak into this for the recording, and Professor Eller can uh, 
uh, take those for you. So do we have any takers first? I have always, I have always, sorry, I have always enjoyed Ray Bradbury's work uh, for its poetic fiction. Uh, reading Heinlein, reading Asimov, you know, you grow up. He's one of the authors that is really put forward. Um, I never saw the Lewis connection before, but of course now you've made it clear for us. Uh, one of the books, though, one of the works that was made in the film. Uh, Fahrenheit, and you say Fahrenheit 451. Now, I'm, we always called it 451. We don't know why, but but uh, for those who don't know, the reason it's titled that is because he was trying to find out at what temperature paper will begin to burn. Mm -hmm. And he tried everything to find it, and he ended up calling a fire department. And someone answered right away and says, 451. He says, that's it. That's how he titled it. Is there any thought, I maybe don't know this at all, of turning that into a movie again. It should, I think it should be reborn. I think it should be a, I think it'd be wonderful, especially with us getting rid of all the paper with the technology anyway, you know. But is there any thought of that or continuing of his works? Your wish shall come true sooner <laughs> than you know. In one month, during May, right, HBO is releasing uh, or presenting a, uh, a new version of Fahrenheit 451. Uh, with uh, uh, some updates in the technology, all right? Uh, uh, there's as much at stake with, of course, what's in the cloud today as there is with published books and libraries. And they mix that in, from what I can tell, rather effectively. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. The story you tell is a, is a fascinating story with even more twists and turns. Going into 1953, uh, he's rewritten The Fireman, expanded it from the, the novella that it was uh, in Galaxy Magazine in 1951 to being what will become Fahrenheit. As we develop the hydrogen bomb, as the Russians then also developed the hydrogen bomb, he felt this was the time to bring this out as a full book. But he doesn't have that title, exactly right. He asked the uh, chemistry department at SC, he asked the chemistry department at UCLA. Nobody can tell him to cal how to calibrate to find the temperature at which book paper will combust or ignite or burn. So he does, uh, uh, but in the meantime, his illustrator, Joe Mugnini, is already illustrating covers for the book and uh, just throws a number down there and calls it Fahrenheit 204. And Bradbury looks at it and says, Joe, I think that's a little low. Uh, let's, let's try it again. So Mugnini, who is nobody's fool, gives him another nice little mock-up and it says Fahrenheit 205. <laughs> Well, while this is going on, finally Ray calls the, um, uh, the fire station in, in his neighborhood, and the fire captain on duty that time says, sure, let me look it up. What do firemen do when they're off duty often? They are arson investigators. So they have references like this. And he says, sure, absolutely, that temperature is uh, uh, 451 degrees Fahrenheit. And Ray took that and reversed it. Fahrenheit, he would say 451 in the early days, but he came to be settled on saying Fahrenheit 451. It has a ring to it. It has an emotional character to it. Now, in Europe, you can find early Danish editions that are published as 233 Celsius. <laughs> so it's a strange world, the world of publishing. OK. So we made somebody happy tonight with our first answer, so. <laughs> Hi, I'd like to uh, just briefly tell something Ray Bradbury told an audience of mainly English teachers at the National Council of uh, Teachers of English. Mm -hmm. I think this was in Florida. I was uh, delighted to be in the audience, and so were a lot of English teachers who were using computers. So Ray began his keynote talk, and he basically was saying, we don't need computers. You know, I, I still work on a manual typewriter quite often. This was in the 90s. And uh, people started standing up and walking out. Uh, and eventually he uh, got around to all the human uh, qualities that writing and reading uh, entail. Uh, and I, I wonder if you could just comment uh, about how 
his treatment of technology in things like Fahrenheit 451 uh, express his beliefs? Oh, well, that's, a, that's a good setup and a good question. Uh, you have in Ray Bradbury someone who uh, was a, uh, a very good typist. I've known him to be able to type in a dark room with no problems whatsoever. He always felt, uh, he once wrote a poem when he was a very young man, an unpublished poem called My Typewriter Wife, about how they would give birth to these wonderful creations. Uh, the electricity would run from his subconscious up to his conscious mind. The storytelling would come down through his fingers and it would come out onto the typewriter. Uh, we have um, uh, two of his uh, manual typewriters from the 50s and 60s uh, that he would still, yes, that's true, into the 90s he would use them on occasion, although, uh, uh, although he had electric typewriters as well by then. But um, Ray Bradbury would classify himself not as a predictor of futures. He wouldn't presume, partially again because uh, that numerate background was not part of his, of his chemistry at all. He was not a predictor of futures. He did what he could do best. He tried to be a preventer of certain futures. And that's what he's doing in Fahrenheit, right? Preventer of certain futures. And that future involves not throwing away the technology, not calling it witchcraft, not getting rid of it through ignorance, but make sure that we use it properly, that we don't misuse it, that we're transparent in our policies. Uh, there have been instances where people have bought books through the cloud and downloaded them to their Kindles and didn't realize that it really doesn't exist on the little machine in most cases, at least early on it didn't. And it can be taken away. And in some cases, it did happen. Um, you can interfere with, um, with a lot of the way that the young people are creative on the internet now with memes. How safe are their memes? How safe are the things they create online? Uh, who controls them? These are things that are as relevant today as, uh, in a different technological way as they were in Ray Bradbury's day when all you had to worry about was the technology of Walkman earpieces for your radio. Uh, or radar or uh, surveillance devices, okay? That would have been the big one for him in the 1950s, the surveillance devices. But uh, yes, Cautionary Tales, Ray Bradbury. You, you mentioned about um, Asimov, but you didn't say anything about a relationship he might. Did, did those two, um, uh, Asimov and Bra Bradbury, do they have any kind of ongoing, there's, oh, some, yeah. there's some similarities there to me, but yes. some contrast to it. Exactly. Um, they met at the 1939, the very first Worldcon, the very first science fiction Worldcon in New York City. They met there. Asimov was just barely at that time a professional science fiction writer, as well as a college student destined to become a, uh, a, a scientist uh, in his uh, academic endeavors. Uh, and they knew each other over the years, um, ad admired certain works um, uh, one to the other. Uh, the last time they met is a very touching story. In 1990, when President Gorbachev made his, made his uh, trip, state visit to the United States, and in Washington, D.C., uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush hosted a banquet for the Gorbachev family. And the invitation list at Gorbachev's request included his family's two favorite authors, Isaac Asimov and Ray Bradbury. And they were both there, and that was the last time they got to see each other because, of course, Asimov died, I think, shortly thereafter. I'm just wondering uh, if you know if there's been any uh, organized attempt in an article or a book or anything to take stock of Bradbury's um, treatment of specifically treatment of faith in his short fiction or anywhere really. Um, I, know, I feel like I've seen several different stories that pretty, pretty explicitly focus on that. You know, um, I'm not sure how unique he was in that, but it certainly seemed like a favorite stomping ground for him. I wonder if anything's ever been done on that. I, I think um, Ray Bradbury has talked a lot about these things in various interviews and in, uh, in lectures that he's given, but I don't know that it's really ever been all pulled together together with 
some of the stories you allude to. Uh, in The Illustrated Man, there's a wonderful story um, uh, called The Man, where the spaceship crew encounters a colonial world where Jesus has come among them. And his ship captain wants to destroy him. But it appears that Jesus is able to escape to the next planet ahead of him. And the captain says, I'll get closer to him every time. I'll get closer. I'll be a week behind him at the next planet, and then a day behind him, and then an hour behind him. And the captain leaves with a few of the crew, but others, including the first officer, stay behind. And the mayor of the little colonial town comes out and says, you want to see him? He's still here. So these little what-if stories have nothing to do with Christianity, of course. He writes The Miracles of Jamie in 1945-46, uh, something that a lot of little boys feel. Uh, we were talking about this earlier today. Uh, Bradbury knows all the phases that little boys go through. Uh, when they're in their late teens, they become H.G. Wells monsters like in The Invisible Man. They want to take over the world, okay? But when they're younger, there's a time when a lot of boys say, wow, I bet I can do miracles. I'm a good kid. And maybe I can be like Jesus and do miracles. And, and the miracles of Jamie is a story where the little boy feels that some things that happen, which are really coincidence, are miracles, and he's riding high until the things he really counts on can't happen because he doesn't do miracles. So these are things that interested Ray. He was very interested when, uh, uh, in, the, in the mid-1950s when the Pope said, it's OK to go to outer space. It's OK to take people to the stars, Pope Pius, whose early, early training included uh, uh, astronomy. Uh, uh, and, and Ray was, uh, was enjoyed that. Ray ultimately felt that all the traditional churches would have to deal someday with going to the stars and potentially have to deal with the idea of contact. Uh, you know, these, these are not things that are traditionally uh, subjects uh, of, of, of interest, particularly in Christian circles. But it interested Ray Bradbury, how would the priests and how would the ministers accommodate if there is contact with other races on other planets? That always, that always interested him. He didn't have any answers more than would be suggested in his stories. Go read Ray Bradbury. Come visit the folks in Waukegan and what they're setting up with the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum. Come visit us in Indianapolis. Together, these two places have brought Ray Bradbury back to his Midwest roots. Uh, come visit the center. Come see his office. Yeah. Come see his dreams. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.